Well, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Olesa Kromoychuk. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much for coming here tonight on this cold, snowy day. We really appreciate it. It's really good to see such an excellent turnout for this really important discussion. Today is the International Human Rights Day, and of course, the atrocities perpetrated by the Russian troops in Ukraine, I think, have tested all our systems to their limits, um, including uh, the various institutions that are meant to protect human rights um, in Ukraine and all over the world. But it's also important to recognize that the voices coming out of Ukraine are beginning to ring louder and Oleksandr Matvichuk um, has been uh, awarded um, this year's Nobel Peace Prize. She just received it a couple of days ago. And if you haven't read her speech, do read it, especially on a day like today. I think it's really important for all of us to, to bear those messages that she passed on uh, to all of us in mind. And I'm particularly pleased that on this day we'll be discussing this very important book. Um, invasion, Russia's bloody war, um, and Ukraine's fight for survival, written by Luke Harding. Um, it's my honor to introduce Luke, though I know he doesn't need introduction, but Luke is an award-winning uh, foreign correspondent with The Guardian. He has reported from Delhi, Berlin, and Moscow, and has covered wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, and Syria. Between 2007 and 2011, he was The Guardian's Moscow bureau chief until the Kremlin expelled him from the country. And he's one of the journalists who were blacklisted in 2022 by the Russian foreign ministry. Um, he is the author of Mafia State and co-author of WikiLeaks Inside Julian Assange's War on Secrecy, among numerous other books. And some of his books have been made into films and have inspired theater productions too. Maybe you could talk about that as well at some point. But of course, he's uh, also been reporting f on Ukraine since 2007, I believe, right? Yeah. And spent <clears throat> much of last year in Ukraine, traveling all over the country. And that is what this book is about. Um, and that's what we, what we will be discussing tonight. So welcome, Luke. Welcome Th to the Ukrainian Th thank Institute. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank I you. will sit down now. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks. Actually, there, there are, there, guys, there's some seats at the front if anyone wants Please to. Please do to, sit to, at the front. Do, do, don't be shy, just come, come, come forward. There are a few seats here um, so, and some over there as well. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so are you, gonna, are you gonna ask me a question, Margaret? I am going yeah. to ask you a question, unless you, unless you don't no, want no, me to. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm going to begin. Uh, come in, everyone, there's uh, plenty of space. I'm going to begin yeah. with a really gentle yeah. question, I think, but one that I've been wondering uh, about quite a lot since I saw this book, uh, when I was approached to, uh, to have a look at it uh, and discuss it at Cambridge, which we did a few weeks ago, yeah. maybe a month ago or so, yeah, yeah. at the festival. And I was thinking, my goodness, a book on the invasion of Ukraine already out? <laughs> <laughs> That's quick. And that was the question I wondered. How did you take that decision? Why did you take the decision to publish it immediately? Not wait, not wait and reflect a little bit longer to see how the war continues, how it ends, presumably. Why now? Uh, what's the reason? Yeah, uh, why now? I mean, I, I, I think because it, it was clear that what what what's happened with the full scale invasion on February the 24th? What was a sort of defining moment? It's uh, I mean uh, uh, Olaf Scholz, the German Chancellor, described it as a kind of Zeitenwender, a kind of turning point in history. And it wasn't just that you know I thought that analytically it felt like that. I mean I was in Kiev on February the 24th, and I write about that at the beginning of the book. And I was among a kind of group of people. Um, I wouldn't say it's a small group, but it wasn't a large group who who had for a long time been uh, saying, suggesting, writing that the, the regime of Vladimir Putin, this sort of darkening regime, was not merely domestically repressive. I mean, that's what I'd reported on before I got booted out of Moscow about what you all know so well about the, the, the way um, opposition had been sort of snuffed out, how um, dissent was becoming harder and harder and harder. But what was also clear to me was that this, this as well as the sort of gloomy domestic stuff, that the regime was internationally dangerous and adventurous. And for a long time, a lot of people, I mean, not everybody, had said that this was too extreme, that when I published a book uh, in 2011 called Mafia State, that this was hyperbolic, you know, it was wrong. And I didn't think so. I didn't think so because to some extent I understood how the regime thought. And also I covered the, the, basically the invasion of Georgia in 2008, which everyone's forgotten about. It was basically a sort of dress rehearsal for what happened in 2014 and again in 2022. Um, and so I guess 
I mean, I mean, I don't know if you're politely suggesting it was a bit arrogant to not at to, all. To, 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 to I'm really it, interested to do it qu quickly. But the, brave, the, brave is the, the word. The, the point, the point was, I knew the bag story. I, you know, I'd, I'd followed it. I'd had, you know, the FSB uh, spy agency had been in my apartment and had bugged it. So I had kind of, I had for a long time, I had a private window into just how thuggish um, and cruel. Um, Th these people were, and also I'd been, you know, wh when the, the troop build-up started in um, autumn of last year, I mean, it feels like a hell of a long time ago, I was convinced that this was not a bluff, that this actually meant there was going to be some kind of large-scale military operation. And whether it was Kiev or Donetsk or Kiev plus Donetsk or somewhere else, no one quite knew, but it just seemed to me this was not theatre. This was in deadly earnest. And so, uh, as I write in the book, you know, I started going back to... Um, uh, well, I was in 2014. I, I did the whole, you know, Ruski Mir kind of takeover of of the east of Ukraine. But but in December, I went to I went to Avdiivka and and was on the front line with the Ukrainian troops, um, uh, you know, peering through um, uh, sites at no man's land and with the Russian positions about 100 meters away. And also worth remembering that there, there was a hot war, that people were dying. You know, I remember just going around this kind of ruined warehouse, similar kind of year to, to now, and it was, it was exactly a year ago. It was cold. Uh, it was um, d depressing. And uh, a piece of graffiti on the wall was just said in Ukrainian, fuck up and you die. This is already a year ago. Um, and then I went back to Kiev and... In January, if I'm honest, among a lot of people in Kiev, there was still kind of holiday mood. It had been Christmas, and there was a something of a reluctance to acknowledge the, the scale of what was coming or what was potentially coming. Um, but I had, you know, various conversations with with Ukrainian government officials and sources of mine, and they were saying, look, you know, Kiev will be hard for them to do, but you know, Mariupol, you know, Mariupol, maybe, maybe, maybe. And I'd been to Mariupol in 2014, so I went back to Mariupol and made a film for the Guardian mm -hmm. and saw the Ukrainian fleet, went to the, the then front line, again, with, with you know, Ukrainian troops, talked to civil society, talked to, talk to pro-Ukrainian activists, saw how the city had flourished, actually. Um, and so I guess what I'm saying was that um, I'd, I'd done the miles, you know, I, I understood the story. Um, and so when it happened, I just thought, it's important to, of course, this is a Ukrainian story, which Ukrainians will, will tell very brilliantly and very well. But I sort of thought it's important for me. I mean, I can do the geopolitics. I can do the analysis. I understand what's, what's happening in terms of international relations. But what I wanted to do was to do the human story and to explain that for a, for a Western audience. Mm -hmm. That this was not some faraway country about which we know little, but this was a... Uh, democracy, this was a European country, um, uh, and not only that, but, but really the future of the, the world was at stake here. And so, yeah, maybe it was arrogant, but I thought it had to be done. And I did not imply that <laughs> at all. Thank you for that answer. And it's, it's on the human stories that actually, about the human stories that I actually want to ask you um, my next question. This book is remarkable, not just because it's such a thorough record of what happened from February and until... September, no, roughly. Yeah, late September. Early so September. I mean, Harkiv, the, we, 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 of Harkiv. We, we just catch the counteroffensives yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in, the, in the northeast and the yeah, south. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which we actually forget because the yeah. events are moving so fast. Yeah. So it's fantastic for that as well as as thorough record. But it's also based on stories, human stories, and stories from you know so, such different parts of society, from the president, the president's speechwriter, the chapter I particularly recommend, to very he, ordinary. He, he was in touch the other day, by the way. Oh, he, wonderful! Yeah, yeah. A new speech coming up. <laughs> well. I, I, I mean, yeah, we sort of wanted advice, but anyway, let's... Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and to ordinary people that you meet in various different parts of Ukraine, what is there one memorable story that you can think of that maybe shifted your understanding of the war or understanding of Ukraine, or maybe a couple? Something that... I mean, I mean there's a couple there. of stories which haunt me. Um, can, can I just say, the ladies here, there are two, three seats at the front. <laughs> You don't want to come forward? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just feeling guilty, you know, but okay, all right, fine. Uh, this, um, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the, I mentioned Mariupol, so the, the Mariupol story that haunts me um, is one of the people I met on the Mariupol trip was a um, pro-Ukrainian guy, activist, who sort of moved there. He'd, he'd been involved in kicking out the DNR in 2014, and he fell in love with a, with a local woman. They settled down, they had a daughter. 
he was the one who took me to the front line with the military, um, and he's called Anatoly Lazar, nice guy. We, we, we talked in January about Russian literature, about Dostoevsky, about you know the, the madness of Putin. Um, and then when the invasion happened, he called, you know, he called me about uh, like late February, early March, and he said they were hanging on, the Russians were close, but morale was good. Um, and then he called me about a week later, by, by which time the entire city was encircled. And he said, can you get my wife and kids out? And at this point, I was in Lviv. Uh, and I said, look, you know, Anatoly, I, I, I don't think I can. I'm really sorry, but, but uh, I can write about it. You know, and I was writing about it. I was talking to the deputy mayor. I was collecting eyewitness testimony, you know, writing about how people were, had no water and were melting snow, how the heating had gone, how the shelling was relentless, how civilian infrastructure was being destroyed. Um, and then he called me again about five days later, and it was midnight. And by this time, the communications had basically gone. And I could just hear the wind sort of whipping off the Sea of Azov. And no, nothing. I couldn't hear his voice. And I just said, look, you know, the, the, world, is, the world is with you. The world is thinking about you. I don't know if you heard me. And uh, and he was lost. So I mean, after after the you know after Mariupol, you know after Azovstal, there were lists. There were lists on Telegram channels of the dead, and I you know two thousand names plus. And I looked very carefully through the names to see if I could find him, and I couldn't find him. And I couldn't find him in the living. I couldn't find him in the dead. And I don't know what happened to him. And I don't know what happened to his family. And I just sort of. <coughs> I don't know. I feel guilty. I mean, I'm not sure there's much I could have done, but I feel guilty. And the, the, other, the other story, which I write about as well, I mean, th those were tough chapters to write, but I think they're really uh, important uh, chapters, and I hope I capture what happened was, was Butcher. I mean, I was in Butcher uh, not, not on day one or two, but about four or five days after the Russians withdrew, and the, the images of Butcher, I think, uh, I think they're some of the defining images of our century, or will, will turn out to be, of the bodies in the streets, of the fact that the Russian army sort of got stopped at Bucha uh, and then took its revenge on the civilian population. And I had friends in Kiev, Ukrainian friends, who put me in touch with, with a woman called um, Tanya, who was rather cool in her 60s, but with dyed red hair. Um, and she lived on Ivana Franco Street in Bucha, um, and with her uh, with her sister-in-law and her nephew Volodya, and Volodya had gone out and he had taken photos of the the wipeout of Ukrainian armored vehicles on Vaksalna Street, or on the main street, on his phone. When it looked like the Russians were beaten, they were going to be kicked back, and of course they swept back in again. Uh, and um, uh, so the Russians came in. They came into the street. They made a checkpoint at the bottom of the street, which I saw. Uh, and they knocked on the door and they confiscated everyone's phones. And they, on Volodya's phone, they found that image. And they just said, you're coming with us. Um, and Tanya just sort of showed me where they'd interrogated him further down the road in a house where they'd, they'd moved the armored vehicle in, smashed down the fence. They'd turn it into a kind of makeshift HQ. And she showed me the tree she climbed up to peer inside over the picket fence to see that the Russians had, had uh, broken Volodya's arm, that he was covered in blood and he was sobbing, saying, I didn't know anything, I didn't do anything, I didn't know anything. And he was dressed in a t-shirt, and it was March, and so they brought warm clothes for him, and he was put in an armored personal carrier and driven away. And, you know, Tanya is sort of sitting there telling me the story, uh, and she, you know, the, ba basically her, the, the mother thought that for three weeks he was still alive. Um, and then the Russians withdrew on March the 31st of this year, and a few hours later, a neighbor came around and said, we found a body. So, um, so Tanya takes me around the corner to another house um, with, there was no one in it, and the, the, the front door had been shot up. There were daffodils growing in the garden. There was a kennel. There was a well and a cellar. Um, and we walked down to the cellar. Actually, she wouldn't go, but we you know, went, went down to the cellar. And there was a blood, bloody mattress. Uh, there was a little children's toy, uh, like a little sort of, you know, plushy, a little sort of soft toy. Um, and 
uh, and basically what had happened was they'd, they'd kept him there for about a week and then one night they came down uh, and they made him kneel and they shot him in the head and left him there. And I sort of tell that story, I mean, it's very hard to not think about that scene having seen it. We made a film again for The Guardian. I cannot watch that film. But, but the importance is there were 1,600 civilians executed in similar fashion in Kiev region. I, in October, I was in uh, Hakev Oblast, and I was in a Zoom by the mass grave with forensic excavators from, from, from Kharkiv who were pulling up bodies. Uh, and basically what was clear to me, and what I try and you know, explain in the book, is that th these were not random incidents, that, that, that they were systemic, that, that they, the soldiers were following orders, that, that basically they had been told to find Nazis, they couldn't find Nazis, so they just randomly executed people, mainly men, but sometimes women. It's the same in Herzog. Um, and the, the, I mean, the, the kind of enormity of, of Russian war crimes in Ukraine, it, it's so great. You, there are, I think, 40,000 plus investigations now. You, you, you could not detail them all. But so what I tried to do was by telling one or two stories, you tell the whole story. You know, it's the, the, with, with the small, you tell the big. Uh, but yeah, but they haunt me. <clears throat> for sure. Thank you for sharing that. You partly answered my next question. I was going to ask you, how, how does a reporter, how does a war reporter continue uh, telling the stories of an ongoing war after events such as Mariupol, after Bucha, after Izum, and keeps the reader's attention, maintains the reader's attention without allowing them to become immune to these stories? Well, I mean, the book is not just horror. <coughs> I mean, what, what, what I try and do as well is explain why Ukraine is winning. Actually, and I think Ukraine is winning. Um, uh, and I, you know, there's quite a—I mean, fun is not, is not quite the right word, but there's quite, there's quite an interesting uh, chapter which which I thought about for for ages. And for any for Ukrainians, none of this is kind of new or or um, s surprising. But but the, what became clear to me was the sort of the extremely networked horizontal nature of Ukrainian society. And I had lots of conversations with, with Andrei Kirkov. Um, you know, who, who I had, had dinner with on the night of the invasion. Borscht, uh, he cooked for you, he? Didn't he? he cooked borscht, very good borscht, by the way. He if, if, if he invites any of you for borscht, I recommend Andre Kukov's borscht. Don't take up that invitation. Um, but he was saying that, that basically, you know, he would talk about the Cossack period. I mean, he would, in a way, he kind of educated me. And, and the fact that there was an officer democracy back in the 16th and 17th century, that, that Ukraine never had the kind of feudal vertical model uh, that, that the Russians were used to, and that for understandable historical reasons, Ukraine has always mistrusted the state, whether it was the Russian imperial state or the Soviet state. You know, they never thought much of the state. And also, as Kukov always says, you know, Ukraine is now love disagreeing with each other and, and live in a state of what he, he described, I think accurately, but you may disagree, as organized anarchy. You know, that there are 400 political parties in Ukraine and they all kind of you know, squab squabble, squabblesome, but, and, and rebellious as well. Um, but but that, that networking, I think, is one of the reasons that Ukraine is prevailing in the war, because just from my, yeah, I've, I've spent most of the year in Ukraine, I've seen pr you know, pretty much all of it, apart from zones of Russian occupation when the Russians are there. I mean, I kind of arrived soon afterwards, but, you know, a few vignettes sort of stick with me. One of them was in Lviv. I went to go and see some students early on in, in March who'd abandoned their studies and were making Molotov uh, cocktails. And, you know, I talked to a history student. I was saying, why are you not studying history? And they'd say, this is history. Mm -hmm. You know, we are making history. And then, you know, another Molotov, you know. <laughs> and then I was sort of saying, well, look, this Molotov is not going to stop a Russian tank. And they say, yeah, you know, one student said to me, yeah, but the person driving the tank will realize that we hate them. <laughs> uh, and that, that sort of psychologically is quite important because they'd all been told that Ukrainians would welcome yeah. them with flowers and all the rest of it. So that it was sort of you know, showing, the, showing the light to be a lie. And similarly in Lviv as well, uh, I'd go and have breakfast um, and I'd come back and I was outside the, the uh, I'd walk past the recruit, recruitment center. My Airbnb was right next to where a load of U Ukrainian guys were coming back from abroad. Um, some of them were local, some of them were coming back from abroad. And they were not fighters, they were IT guys, they were builders. And some of them were already in uniform, some of them had just turned up and were wearing baseball caps. And, you know, the, the, it was the same routine, and snow was blowing. And every morning, uh, the, the guy would make a speech, and uh, the, the sort of officer in charge, and then he would say, Who's, if you've got a car, raise your hand. 
And so out of a group of 40 people, maybe five people would put their hand up. And, and then the people with a the car, they'd form groups, they'd introduce themselves, and off they go. And it was clear that of those 40, you know, four, eight, 10, 12 would not come back, you know. And, and yet you talk to them and they were completely committed. It's the absolute opposite of Russia, where, where people have to be dragged mm. into fighting. People were volunteering, they knew. They were not naive about it. They were, they were doing it. And, and then there were, you know, there were, uh, what was the polite word? Pensioners, you know, o older ladies uh, making soup, helping refugees, you know, making camouflage nets. And, and Putin's, I mean, he's made many strategic errors uh, in the war, but one of them was to assume that he was just fighting the Ukrainian army. That if he could kill Zelensky, which was the original plan, you know, seize Kiev, kill Zelensky, and defeat the army, then he could pacify mm -hmm. Ukraine. Uh, and that Ukrainians were basically rural Russians. They were the kind of stupid cousins. It was incredibly condescending, uh, patronizing, uh, wrong. Uh, and actually what he's discovered, or you know, what the Russian army have discovered, is, is he's fighting 40 million plus people. Uh, and that is ultimately why uh, they will lose, whether they lose next month or in a year or whatever. I mean, Ru Russia, to my mind, has already lost this war insofar as the goal, the plan was to take the whole of Kiev. And they, they really thought they could do it quickly and they thought they could, they could have the whole country by summer. And I'm, I'm, you know, when we get the archives, I'm really curious as to who from the opposition bloc party they had lined up to run the country because they had everything. Mm -hmm. they had, they'd already had a sort of shadow cabinet of people to go in. Um, and in fact... And apparently we were preparing Yanukovych to ship yeah, him back as well. Yeah, yeah Yanukovych <laughs> may be, you know. Uh, and in fact they were met by fire and by fury and by an incredible fight back that has, well, it's inspired the world, it's inspired me, it's inspired everyone in this room. And, and it's been a privilege to report on it and it's been a privilege to write this book. Yeah, I suddenly really enjoyed the chapter on sort of horizontal nature of Ukrainian civil society. I just call it horizontal. That's yes, all I call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I've heard people refer to Ukrainian society as network nation, no, as well, yeah, which I, I also really like as well. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the next edition of <laughs> yeah. the book. Nothing brings a book to life like the author reading the book. Would you do us an honor and read a little bit? I have to borrow your copy, but Fantastic. yeah. I, so I'll, I'll keep this brief because I have been to literary events where authors get ca slightly carried away with their own prose and <laughs> after about five minutes you're thinking, yeah. I'll, I'll let you know if anybody <laughs> that, that falls was great, asleep. But, but I'm a bit bored now. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to, I literally read you uh, just uh, uh, I, you know, a page and a half. Um, so, th so this is the, this is the evening uh, of February 23rd when I'm in Kiev, having you know, already been there for a couple of months. Um, it was, so this is the start of the book. <clears throat> it was the evening before everything changed. The Ukrainian novelist Andrei Kukov had invited me for dinner. A few friends, he said, and Borsch. We had first met earlier that memorable winter. A pleasant meal in a Georgian restaurant in Padil. Uh, a glass of red in a boutique cafe near the old city. The date was February the 23rd, 2022. It was 8.15 p.m. and I was late. I stopped in a shop, bought a, bought a bottle of colonist port from a winery in Odessa and hurried to Kirchhoff's flat. These meetings happened under the shadow of war. The news, which I was writing for my newspaper, The Guardian, was alarming. A terrible evening. Terrible even. A week earlier, Russian-backed separatists had shelled a village in Ukrainian-controlled territory next to the pro-Russian regions of Luhansk and Donetsk. The missile had landed in a school gym. Mercifully, no one was killed, but the eight-year conflict in the east was heating up. Humour uh, was essential in these dark times. Kirchhoff sent me a meme via WhatsApp. It showed Fyodor Dostoevsky's head floating surreally in a hole in the school's wall, peering at the rubble. Around the great 19th century Russian writer's head were soccer balls, a mural and climbing rope. Kirchhoff was an agreeable companion, the author of many playful and magically luminous books, and Ukraine's most celebrated living writer. Also, remarkably, he was an optimist. I, by contrast, was increasingly gloomy. The omens pointed in one scarcely believable, unbelievable direction. Russia was about to invade Ukraine. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I felt like we should uh, uh, the, 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 the applause. <laughs> It's difficult to read your own prose in front of people. 
Look, shall we tackle the B question? <laughs> I'll <laughs> okay. explain to everybody what yeah, I yeah, mean. Yeah. The Bulgakov question. So when I um, started reading the book, the first thing I saw was the epigraph and it was from the White Guard by Mikhail Bulgakov. A complicated figure, to say the least, for Ukrainians. And I was a little bit taken aback. And then I was, and then, then you come back to Bulgakov throughout the book now and again. Um, and and, and I, you took me to task. And, I and, did. And I confronted you. Afterwards, we became friends. It's despite that conversation. I, I would yeah. like to think that before we were friends as well. The friendship didn't go away. <laughs> um, I mean, I think this is an important discussion to be had, to be honest. Um, it's a discussion about how do people learn about Ukraine? How do people learn about the region more generally? And why do we still learn uh, about Ukraine through, or very often through Russian literature? And often that literature is imperialist literature or has an imperialist position on the rest of the mm -hmm. region. And rather than um, given my view of Bulgakov and Russian literature, I would like to quote very briefly Tamara Hundorova, who will be familiar to some people in this room, but maybe not everybody. She's a Ukrainian literary scholar. She's spoken at the Institute many times. She's, she's fantastic. This is a quotation badly translated by me from one of her interviews, where she talks about Russian culture and why it's problematic. She says, I believe that Russian culture is not only about aesthetics and style, but also about ideology and the unconscious and, and the social unconscious. So culture is responsible for the wars that Russia started and for the current war in Ukraine as well. The experience of colonization and imperial power is inscribed in Russian culture. Um, other former empires, say the British Empire, are busy analyzing and deconstructing the colonial images and myths inscribed in this culture. But the doesn't happen in Russia, she says. Didn't happen in Imperial Russia, didn't happen in Soviet Russia, and doesn't happen in, in Putin's Russia either. And she says, this is what I call the virus of Imperial greatness, Imperial messianism, which infected um, Russian culture. Have we been infected by this vi virus in the West? Is it why we continue to perceive the whole region through, um, through Russian culture? And is it why we're reluctant to pause it? Yeah, uh, which was the verb used by, by Ukraine's culture minister in a piece he wrote last week Indeed. for Guardian uh, about what should happen. Um, so, look, on, on Bolkakov, to be clear, the, the, uh, the epigraph was a sort of starting point. It, it wasn't, you know, a political position. I mean, it, it was, it was two, there were two, two reasons I did it. One, one more. Uh, so, and, and the, 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 the ending of the chapter, the idea I took for it was not the, what you might call the kind of Russian show, chauvinism or imperialism. It was the idea that Kiev would endure, and it was merely in what form would it endure, because back then, a lot of people, including quite a lot of people in the in the government, thought the Kiev would fall. That that really was the feeling, and and you just have to remember the number of people who were leaving. I mean, some people were staying, and things were working. Of course, the army was staying, police were staying. Not everyone was leaving, but the, but the mood of fear and dread was enormous. Uh, so that that was the starting point. But also, I mentioned Bulgakov because actually. To be fair to me, uh, uh, in in the the, the sort of uh, in chapter three, there's, I have a, a long and interesting conversation with the, the head of, Ukra of Ukrainian foreign intelligence, and he had actually brought up Olgarkov in the White Guard when I'd seen him for a kind of for a, for a, for a wide ranging and fascinating chat, which was basically along the lines that you suggest uh, that. He was saying that we always understood Russia much better than they understood us. Partly it was language, that Ukrainians are bilingual and, and Russians don't speak Ukrainian and therefore can't really figure out what's going on. Uh, partly for, for sort of patronizing reasons that, 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 that Russia's always regarded Ukraine as a kind of lost kingdom, as a province, basically. Um, and he was saying that their, their understanding, by contrast, was much better. And we were talking about Putin and you know, whether he was disconnected from reality, whether we could say he was mad, uh, and head of foreign intelligence said he wasn't mad. Um, but obviously we discussed his essay, uh, which um, is, uh, is an astonishing document and turned out to be a predicate for war. The essay that he wrote in summer of 2021, basically saying Ukrainians and Russians were one people. And it was a kind of pseudo tour through a thousand years of, 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 of history. And then he was basically saying that this, Chauvinism also extended into the cultural sphere, and he mentioned Solzhenitsyn, and he mentioned Bulgakov uh, uh, as well. And, and he said that the way that Bulgakov saw Ukrainian national forces, uh, he saw them as this, uh, you know, unfathomable, inchoate, dark kind of peasant mass besieging Kiev. Um, so. 
that's in the book as well. And then I had another interesting conversation with Dmitry Litvin, who's Zelensky's speechwriter. We're also talking about culture. And interestingly enough, Litvin, uh, Litvin thought that Gogol was okay, um, but he said that you know Bulgakov's epoch is finished. And I quote him saying that too. Uh, so I think I think what I'm doing is I'm not taking a position. It's for you guys to decide. I, I would just what I'm trying to do is to just explain the discussion. And f you know how I see it, I, I see what's happening in Ukraine as a classic anti-colonial struggle. It really is a struggle um, in a way that you, you might have expected 30 years ago, but but it's happening now, and it's a struggle uh, against a project which is clearly. The, you know, Putin's goal is to destroy Ukraine, to de-Ukrainize Ukraine, to get rid of its language, its culture, its history, its monuments, its symbols, and its people. It's, it's genocidal in, in intention. It is fascist, and I think we should call it fascist, uh, because it is fascist. It's, it's, it's Russian fascism in, in our century. Um, every bit is toxic. Uh, and appalling as German fascism, fascism in the 1930s. So I can see the cultural conversation is difficult. I can see there is no reason to have 400, 400, streets, 400 streets in Ukraine named after Pushkin, uh, right? I mean, uh, and Pushkin will fall. <laughs> you know, L L Lenin has fallen, Pushkin is falling. Is already, falling. Or, or There's going to be de Pushkinization yeah. going on there. <laughs> and maybe there'll be de Bulgakovization too. Ultimately, that's for Ukraine to decide, uh, in the same way that Ukraine decides how it defines victory, uh, in the same way Ukraine decides what its political course is, you know, to what extent it, it integrates with the Western community, the European Union, yeah, of you course. know, who, who its allies are. So it's an important conversation, and I was merely trying to get it out there. But it's for us here in the West, for all of us, to explore the literature that we haven't explored, the anti-imperialist literature that exists in Ukraine. And, you know, once we start reading Shevchenko, Lesi Ukrainka, Vasilstus, and I can keep the, you know, they keep going with the list, Oksana Zabushko, Serhii Zhadan, all of these writers, we will actually understand why Ukrainians are fighting the way they're fighting, why there is this horizontal network nation, why there is this distrust of authority, yeah. why we don't, you know, celebrate our leaders and so on because it's all there that defiance that surprised the world is very much can, in our culture can, uh, just on that I just I just want one, one other lovely anecdote I'd like to share so uh, I, I was in uh, uh, a um, town called Shevchenko in Kharkiv Oblast um, after it got liberated um, and uh, driving towards kind of Kupinsk and stopped off and uh, talked to the, the current mayor um, and I was really interested in what was going on, particularly the whole question of collaboration because you, 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 know, you go to some liberated villages where 300 people stayed. Uh, someone always collaborated but very often it was a very small number of people and in one village in Kharkiv Oblast I said, you know, well how many collaborators were there? And Artyom and Sergei was the answer, like two guys. <laughs> Artyom and Sergei collaborated, and by the way, the SBU arrested them yesterday and, and have taken them to Artyom and Sergei, you know, that's it, you know, bad choice. Um, but in Shevchenkov, there was a, there was a, there was a kind of local pro-Russian guy who was known to have a sort of pro-Russian, pro, pro Putin position, was kind of regarded as the, as the town loony. And of course, when the Russians swept in to Shevchenkov in February, yeah, end of February, he became the mayor. He became the sort of new people's mayor. And anyway, and there's video of him. I mean, he, he pulled down the Ukrainian trident in the main square. He was installed there. He had a cabinet of, of people. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the Ukrainian flag was ripped down. And they put the Russian flag up and they put Putin there. And I was coming in thinking, oh, for my story, wouldn't it be great if I can see the Putin, you know, painting and, you know, we can, we can make, take some photographs. And I said, well, what do you do with Putin? They said, oh, we ripped him up and threw him away. Right, so Putin was gone. And um, uh, there was Shevchenko on the wall. And I said, okay, you've got Shevchenko, that's great. We all love Shevchenko. You know, there, there he is. He's sort of kind of watching us now. Um, you know, kind of <laughs> always, always, always watching us. And, and I said, I said, but why haven't you got Volodymyr Zelensky? Uh, and he said, Ukrainian presidents come and go. Shevchenko is eternal. Yes. <laughs> I think we all agree with that. <laughs>
and, and, and for me, better than anyone, he summed up the difference with Russia. Indeed. The, the, the leading figure was not a president, because presidents were ephemeral. You could vote them in, you can vote them out, because yeah. Ukraine is democratic. You know, unlike Russia, because you, you can never get rid of Putin. You know, he's a zombie. You know, he's going on forever. Um, but Shevchenko is, Shevchenko is the town. Fantastic. <laughs> um, I know you're all waiting to ask your questions, so I'll ask one last question, and then we can open the floor. Um, you've traveled to so many different parts of Ukraine. You've seen, you've seen Ukraine in its diversity. You've probably been to places that most Ukrainians have not been to in Ukraine. If you, so you're, you, you're an outsider, but you, you're a bit of an insider as well. How would you explain, I've been asked to explain Ukraine so much over the last nine months. How would you explain Ukraine to people who haven't been there? Well, uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, the, the, thing, the thing that's quite hard to explain, and this is so stupid for, for this audience, but it's just how big it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and sometimes I had to explain that to my own news desk. You know, I'd be in Kiev and they said, well, look, can you go to Kharkiv? You know, file, file a piece and come back. It's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's too far away. You know, it's, it, 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 it's, in fact, it, you know, it's 580 kilometers. In fact, we, we met at a train station. We did. We? <laughs> the train station, getting the night train to Kiev. And that's, you know, that's a whole I, night. I, I've done that journey 20 times. It's a whole night just to get to Kiev and then to get east the front line is another day's traveling and when I was in Herzon Oblast recently doing, doing the liberation I mean it, you know it was it was kind of um well it, it was important to be there but it was a very difficult story to do because the, the war was going on there were booms everywhere I was on the front line um just before the Russians withdrew from Herzon Oblast uh and with the 58th Brigade, and they took us to their First World War style trench. And I was thinking, okay, look, it's the First World War. And I, then I, I saw that I had a tour around the trench, and then there were three guys playing with look, what looked like a kind of you know video game. And in fact, they were the drone operators, and they showed me that they'd missed you know gr gray smoke on the screen that we missed, etc. Um, so we're going to have another go. And they send the coordinates to the artillery guys, so somewhere else. And then while I'm sort of ten minutes later, while I'm somewhere else in the trench, there's a boom. And then there's black smoke, like in the real world, not on the screen, pouring over, and they got the target. They basically got, I think they got a, a Russian armored vehicle over the, the, the kind of autumnal tree line. Um, but the point was just getting to these villages. I mean, we, we then went to this liberated village called Mialova. Uh, um, and uh, the bridges had been blown, so we had to take a detour, and then we talked to the guys on the bridge, and they said, you can go that way, but watch out for mines. So we thought, oh God, okay. Um, and so then we see a Ukrainian armored vehicle, and we follow that, and make sure we drive in their tracks. And we do the village, the first guy I talk to turns out to be brilliant. He tells me the whole story about the collaborators, including, you know, 10 in this village out of 500, one of whom was a woman who fell in love with a Russian soldier and left with him. I mean, <laughs> life is strange, but anyway. Um, and then he says, yeah, and then he shows me where the Russian soldier's been living in the house opposite, and there are their teacups on the table. They just got, you know, they'd gone the previous day. And he said, yeah, I could get a signal in my roof. And when, the, when, when I saw the Russian armor, I would text the coordinates to my son who lives in Dnipro. And he would tell the Ukrainian army. And on one occasion, he saw a grad and it was destroyed. Which it goes back to my earlier point about why Russia will lose. You know, because, <laughs> because that guy was helping and no one knew that guy was in the resistance, but he was. Um, but anyway, my point was, you know, as we came back, um, there was an enormous column of, of, of Ukrainian uh, hardware going to the front, uh, including a tank. And the tank is coming towards us, and obviously we have to move off the road. And I'm just thinking, is this the moment we hit a mine and it's all over? You know, and it wasn't. I mean, here, I'm okay. But the, the landscape, the physical landscape has been so shattered. I've seen so much destruction. I've seen so much rubble. I um, have become very good at distinguishing between outgoing and incoming fire to the point where on the way back from that trip, where there were Ukrainian policemen wanted a lift, so we gave them a lift in our car, and we got to a checkpoint, and the Ukrainian grad position must have been 200 meters away, and these grads came flying over our heads. And we'd had quite a day, and the policeman was like ducking, and we were going, no, no, it's outgoing. It's outgoing. It's outgoing. Oh, okay, you know. So, so you, you know, I understand the rhythm of war, but 
what, what I guess I'd like to say is, you know, it, it's a great country, it's a brilliant country, but there are people living on the front line still. There are um, pensioners mainly who refuse to leave. I mean, for, for understandable reasons, for honourable reasons, but who are living in hell. And I, I think, I, I guess my, my plea is that, look, as the war goes on, we're now in the 10th month, that we keep an eye on the human side, that we realise these are real people living in circumstances they didn't choose, making impossible decisions. And uh, I said to a lot of people, why didn't you flee? And they said, we've got no money and nowhere to go. Um, and I think, you know, U Ukraine is winning, slowly but surely, but I think it's going to be a long war. And I, I, I mean, th th this crowd gets it, but I just think in your conversations you have with other people, you need to, to explain that, that we, need, we need to go the distance and that we continue to react to what we see in the news with empathy and with, with kindness and with solidarity. Yeah, and that we're not passive observers. We don't just sit back and, and, and watch this war unfold, that we can actually all do something about it and make sure that the victory is closer than... And, and just than by it. being here and having a Absolutely. conversation to start. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Um. Right, so I'm going to um, collect some questions, uh, but I just wanted to mention that we are recording this conversation. It would be lovely if you could introduce yourselves, but bear in mind that we're recording it. Uh, so I saw three hands. Let's begin with Lady ba at the back. Tanya, Tanya. <laughs> Uh, good evening, my name is uh, Tatiana Nestichuk. Um, my question um, must be that right at the beginning. There are now, um, I believe, 52,000 prosecutions of war crimes in Ukraine. This is according to the most information from our prosecutor general. Um, and you said that in your book you wanted to witness a few of those. Do you think um, that part of the job of journalists in this war uh, might be recording and witnessing the crimes and then do you think that it is a journalist's job to then report those crimes? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, uh, yeah, that's an interesting question, it's a good question. Um, a, a tricky question too. I, I mean, I, th I think we, we, we do report them uh, and also I think that the Ukraine war is probably the most hyper-scrutinised war that there's been. I mean, there's just an abundance of material, wh whether it's video, whether it's stuff people have shot on their iPhones, whether it's telegram posts, uh, whether it's sometimes Russian soldiers incriminating themselves, whether it's foren forensic examinations of the kind that I've seen. Um, I think it's really important because there's a sort of sense, that, I mean, one of the reasons Russia's been able to do this is because for so long it's, it's been able to behave with total impunity. Actually, there have been a series of egregious episodes, including the war in Georgia, including the murder of Alexander Litvinenko, you know, attempted murder of Sergei Skripal. I was just, uh, funny enough, I was just in Vienna at the weekend for the German premiere of uh, a play by Lucy Preble based on my book, A Very Expensive Poison, about the whole Litvinenko case. Um, and... There's a thread. I mean, it, and, and basically what, what has happened is that um, Putin does these egregious things and he gets away with it and so he keeps going. And it gets big, the monster gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it, it, the, the international community, including this country, has been too slow to react appropriately to, to what's been going on, which is why he's now, I think, overreached with, with, the, with the Ukraine invasion. But I think what, what the Ukrainian government is asking for, what Zelensky is asking for, is you know, deoccupation. Um, but after that comes justice and accountability. So, so Zelensky is saying he wants reparations and then he wants war crimes trials for the Russian leadership. And I think that's entirely appropriate. And for now, that seems a dream. It seems impossible. But many, many impossible things have already happened in this conflict. Uh, and I think the hard work needs to be done now. So at some point, if the regime falls, if there's an opportunity to arrest these people, uh, and by, by the way, for all of, the, for all of their you know, ultra-nationalism, they, they enjoy the good life. They enjoy being in the West. They like their yachts. They like their mistresses. They like their bank accounts. They, they like or they liked British education. Uh, 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 so, so there will come a point where those things are in play. And I think whether justice takes two years, five years, or 20 years, there should be justice, and we should do everything we can to prepare for that moment. Thank you. So you've got your hand up. Yeah, um, I've known Luke for many years, and I'm a great admirer. You and Grant, I worked in UK law enforcement and then in for quite a number of years, including the 
uh, just after the Orange Revolution and just before and after the Maidan EU pro program for the system to Ukraine. Generally, although with honorable exceptions, they were an absolute discord, there we are. And um, they did exactly what Lucas mentioned, gave green lights and ignored things. My question is, but you mentioned it's a long haul. What are the issues you think <coughs> can be most highlighted to keep public pressure fully behind Ukraine to fund and supply and to keep out thinking the Russians? And very quickly as a follow-up, for follow on about the, the nation which has so many questions to answer. What, if you had the opportunity to meet them, what would you like to ask of Gerhard Schroeder and Angela Merkel? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so, Easy questions. Uh, so, let, let me, um, I, I'll concentrate on the last question. Uh, the, so the, the, the Germans, I, I mean, look, I have a, I've got a chapter in, in my book, uh, you and called, 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 called The Allies, which, which looks, at, looks at why Germany's got Ukraine so wrong, and there are several factors, including what, what I call a, a misplaced culture of remembrance. In other words, the, the German guilt over the Second World War is transferred to, to the Russian state, rather than to Ukraine and Belarus, which were the two countries that suffered most. And in fact, you, you know, if you look at how, how much territory of Russian territory was yeah. occupied by the Nazis, it was, it was relatively up to ten percent. Small, and yet the entirety um, of Ukraine was. Yeah. And um, you know, the, the, I think I think it's probably uh, basically uh, Germany's biggest post-war strategic error was to think that you could <clears throat> separate. Uh, the economy from politics, that you could have a successful you know, uh, and large-scale trade relationship with Germany while ignoring the fact that this, this regime, which when I got there was sort of softly autocratic, then became more and more autocratic and is, is now basically totalitarian. It's a, it's a fascist totalitarian country uh, that you could you could just ignore all that because because you know the gas has to flow. So so it was it was a huge error. I, I think what, what's interesting is that the, the German Greens have been more ideologically nimble and flexible than than, than Schultz's party. And uh, 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 Annalena Baerbeck, the German Foreign Minister, was actually in the same position of the of the Africa that I saw a year ago. So she was also there, and I think that really. That really brought it home to her and explains why they've been so stalwart. But b before we get carried away, I mean, we're sitting in London, and if the Germans became addicted to, um, to Russian gas, we in London became addicted to Russian money. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think our crime was the greater I in the end. And, and the fact that, I mean, you know, I've written other books on, on Russia, um, the, the fact that up until very recently, um, it was possible to buy a British passport if you were a Russian oligarch. You could buy visas for your, for your entire family. You could invest. You could domicile here. You could use offshore structures to hide your money. British accountants who do it for you. You could hire peers. Uh, you could um, buy peerages. I'm allowed to say that. I mean, basically, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's your, your, your friends, right? All my friends. I mean, it's, it's been it's recorded. A, uh, well, <laughs> allegedly. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, well, you know, I mean, the fact that Yevgeny Lebedev is a peer is an absolute scandal, <laughs> and 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 and, and it, basically, Russian money had a corrosive effect on British politics. Uh, and don't get me started on on the Russian influence campaign behind Brexit. So, so we've also made our major errors. And uh, I just, while we're on British politics, I'd be really interested to know what the room thinks. But but one one of the very few rows I have with my Ukrainian friends is about Boris Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> And so I, 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 I say to them, you know, we're, we're sitting up drinking the Samogun, sort of, you know, it, 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 we're drinking the home brew, and, um, the, the, and, and I say, look, he's a liar, he's a cheat, he's immoral, don't get me started on him and women, you know, the relationship with Lebedev, and they go, no, we love him, we love him, we love him, and I understand why he's loved, because of the tank weapons and the fact that, to his credit, he, he came up very clearly, very early, more, more or less, uh, was talking about Ukrainian victory when it seemed like kind of, uh, you know, ridiculous fantasy. And also, 
the, the, the song which I cannot get out of my head. I don't know how many of you have heard, heard Dobri Dien, Everybody, sung by Vasily Charisma. It's a rap song with, with the Boris Johnson chorus line is Dobri Dien, everybody, like this. <laughs> and, and you get into any taxi in, in Ukraine and you hear this fucking song. <laughs> So, so look, I mean, he's kind of come good, but, but we, we, we were much in error with Russia, and we, we need to acknowledge that. And do you want to comment on the first question? How do we, what how do was, we keep sorry. support? How do we keep the support? How do we keep? How can we win over the waverers? Yeah. In the West, uh, I, I, in the UK, in the US. Yeah, I, do, I don't think there are many waverers. I mean, I, I think there may be some. I mean, on the far left, far, far right, there are, there are people who, who for whatever strange ideological reason, take a sort of pro-Kremlin position. But I, what, what I see, and I've been mostly in Ukraine this year, and not so much in the UK, I, I see an enormous outpouring of support. For, for Ukrainians, uh, I know lots of people who've been hosting, you know, Ukrainian refugees. Uh, I, I think. Unlike in the U.S., where where the Republican Party is divided between the, the MAGA faction, who seem to still love Putin for reasons I explained in my book Collusion, uh, and the, you know the others who are sort of pro-Ukrainian, um, being being supporting supporting Ukraine is completely bipartisan. There's, there's not a, there's not a serious political party in this country which doesn't support Ukraine. Uh, and you know if if and when Keir Starmer becomes prime minister, I don't expect that to change. I think the support is 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 durable. So you can't convince everybody, um, but I think there's a plurality of support. I think the bigger problem is, is keep, keep keeping interest in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Robertus and then Sir in the jump. Yep. Robertus Young University of Cambridge, uh, you mentioned the resistance on and somehow, I mean, I started the Second World War and the Ukraine, of course, was the place the resistance was much stronger than anywhere else. So for me, it wasn't a surprise. Um, and in a way, that is very positive, of course. Uh, what is a surprise to me is the apathy in Russia and the complicated situation. I think if any situation is in flux at the moment, it's within Russia. Ukrainians are defending as much as they can, but within Russia, things are changing. And it's very difficult to ascertain that and where it is actually happening. Yeah. I was struck by the, the recent innocuous fires that happened in trade centers around Moscow. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, one day, another day, yet another day, so there were three of them. Um, also, the discussions that went on about Doge TV. Yes. I mean, so there are changes going on in the Russian community, and what do you make of them? Do you see some kind of, uh, well, serious opposition? I'm afraid I don't. Uh, uh, I, I mean, I'd like to. I'd like to. Um, and certainly early this year, you know, we were all thinking about palace coup and, and clearly the oligarchs were unhappy um, and the elite were unhappy and while the, the power guys kind of knew about this war, I'm not sure Russian society in general knew about it. Um, so, but the, the, the problem is that a lot of people who opposed the war have either been locked up or they've fled. All of the invest Russian investigative journalists I work with are now all living in exile. They all, they all left. And, and most of them left in March. Some of them had left before. Very good people who were doing real journalism, they're, they're all out. Um, you know, Navalny is in prison. His, his you know, political movement has been rolled up. And, and, and meanwhile, people are getting ludicrous sentences for, for nothing. I mean, I mean, it's... I think Russia has become... I mean, I mean, you're, you're the historian, but you know, Russia, to my mind, is certainly as, as repressive as, as the Brezhnev Soviet Union, and I think probably is heading towards the 1930s. I mean, it's, it, it's, and, but but it's kind of smart repression insofar as the borders are still open. So if you're really unhappy, you can leave, um, and that that means that those who stay generally are more controllable. Um, so unfortunately, I don't see a, a revolutionary m moment in 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 Russia. I don't see. I don't see. I mean, w the problem is we keep, we've all seen The Death of Stalin by Amanda you know, Lucci, and it's such a brilliant, wonderful film that you think, oh, it's got to be like that. You know, it's got to be <laughs> bury her, taken out into the courtyard and shot and, and problem managed. Um, and we, I have my, my second chapter is on Putin and his kind of curious mental world. And, uh, you know, I consider the question as to whether he is mad or, or merely um, operating within his own sort of dark logic, which is the Yulia Tymoshenko view. I mean, we discussed this, and I, I, I kind of quote her. Um, um, uh, and there, you know, there are a few runic clues. I mean, he's just cancelled his, his annual press conference for the first time in 10 years. He looks terrible. 
Um, but, but he's had so much facial work done, it's hard to know whether it's cancer or just you know, bad Botox you know, that, <laughs> that makes him look so puffy. Uh, and he, we, we also know that he's, he's you know, paranoid about his personal survival. I mean, the, the defining Putin image uh, of the last three years is, is a small man at the, the one end of a 15 meter long table with another small man at the other end. I mean, I mean it would be funny were it not so dark. So I, I think we have to assume that he's going to carry on, that there's not going to be an inflective moment where, where the masses r rise up. And unfortunately, I think that anyone who comes after Putin will probably be a kind of neo-Putin to some degree. But I also think that, 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 that when Putin does fall or die, I think the most likely scenario is a sort of horizontal exit in the coffin. Maybe that's the moment where the, 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 you know, the war stops or the, the active hostility stops, but we're, we're some way off that. Yes, sir, please. Yes, would you agree or disagree that the beginning of Putin's delusion, or whatever you want to call it, really goes back to the, the collapse of the Eurasian Economic Union, you know, the, the, the Sochi and, and Maida? Because before that, everything that he did was fairly successful. But since that time, I mean, Syria, I don't think anybody would call Syria a success. I mean, they, Killed a lot of people. They, yeah. You know, you know. Then he then he intervened in Libya, which is even stranger. You know, for, for, for some reason I think something to do with kind of the oil there or whatever. And then he had, then he puts Wagner in, in, in various African countries. I mean, none of those are successes. So it's like it's you know his his, his reign is in two different parts. He has the it begins with success, and then since 2014 it's been failure after failure. I, I, don't, I, I, I mean, I don't want to be um, start. Chan ch I don't want to start channeling Dmitry Peskov here, but but I think he would take a slightly different view and would would, 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 would see. Uh, he see, I think he thinks he's winning the war. war. I mean, he, he was recently referencing, you know, this That's week, what I mean by Peter the Great, and saying that we have the Sea of Azov, you know, going for the first time since Peter the Great. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think he thinks he's successful. I mean, part of it is just, you know, for Putin, the Cold War never ended. And he, he now thinks he's in the kind of Third World War, a sort of civilizational struggle against the West. Mm -hmm. He thinks he's fighting America, and the battleground happens to be Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, the number of times I've seen you know black American sniper on Russian state TV, as if you know the Russians are fighting an army of black American snipers. I mean, <laughs> there's, there's one guy whom I shan't name, who's very keen on self-publicity, who's on American TV a lot, but it's one guy. You know, um, so. <laughs> I mean, to me, it looks like Dostoevsky's the gambler. Yeah. He keeps on going to the table, keeps on putting money in, losing it, and then he, and he comes back for more until he loses everything. Well, I, th I, th I think basically he, he's just lost touch w with reality, like all dictators do, and it's become more and more pronounced. He, he also thought that the West was having a a kind of uh, a sort of uh, uh, existential crisis similar to one the Soviet Union had in 1991, that it was declining inexorably, that it was falling, that we were weak and we were divided and we were decadent and permissive and anti-family and we probably wouldn't breed anymore. I mean, God, God no, and we were all Satanists, especially this room, this room is full of Satanists. Uh, uh, and and it, it, it's fantastical nonsense, but it's, it's, it's his kind of information informational cosmos. But would you have done that before 2014? Well, I, I, mean, I, I, I mean, he's been living in it, you know, he, 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 he has convinced himself that 2014 was a CIA coup. Mm -hmm. And I, I was in Kiev in 2014 and it wasn't the CIA coup. <laughs> I mean, it was a heterodox movement by all sorts of people against corruption and against basically someone who is behaving like a Russian governor. Mm -hmm. So, so, uh, yeah, I mean, you can peer into his head, and I do in chapter two, but then I move on. I think we should all move on. Indeed. <laughs> uh, and I feel that I've neglected this part of the room, so I'll come back to this part, because I, I, I have taken down all of the And all also, of if anyone answers. doesn't get their question, I'll see you after. Oh, yeah. fantastic. So, Lesser, please, yeah. um, what guy saw you? I just want to follow on, because there seems to be yeah. an inordinate amount of attention on Putin, uh, rather than on the Russian nation themselves. And you said, okay, a lot of them have fled. We, 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 we all know the news. But what strikes me is that, from let's say, from the ground, where, and I can't remember, there's a Guardian reporting about uh, a school teacher comes back to Kherson and one of the Russians had said to her, who allowed you to live like this? Mm -hmm. Which kind of told me everything we need to know about the Russians, which is that everything there is graft 
uh, sorry, corruption, uh, you know, you must know somebody to yeah. actually afford to live like a school teacher. Yeah. You couldn't possibly have earned it. So on the, on the basis of the soldiers coming in, they don't understand how Ukrainians live or how we could live in a different universe. And then similarly, you find educated Russians in Switzerland who are also deeply, deeply antithetical to the idea that Ukraine exists as a nation. Yeah. So right from the top, the very educated, the MBAs, the people that you meet here in London, right down to the, the Russian or even non-Russian soldiers coming in, they just don't get Ukraine. So at what point, even Putin aside, even next leaders aside, how can you actually transform Russia such that you can decolonize? Because Ukraine fighting its battle is one thing, but we need to get all of Russia to accept us at some point. Yeah. Who? Yeah. Or, or build a wall. I mean, but but yeah. No, no. But I mean, no, to be serious. I, I mean, I think there are two, there are two, two uh, very interesting uh, points. I mean, w one thing that struck me when I was covering Bucha. I mean, for those who've been to Bucha before the war, I mean, it's this wonderful, green, prosperous suburb where you go and take your kids for the weekend or you, you'd move out if Kiev was too much for you. Um, when I was in the Nirvana Franco Street, the, you know, Tanya was telling me that oh, the first car they stole around here was a Tesla. You know, they found the Tesla. They'd never seen a Tesla before. So they, they smashed up the Tesla, then they were sort of, you know, started the Jeeps. And, and uh, there was definitely a degree among, among these soldiers who were 19, 20, 21, very often from extremely backward parts of Russia, uh, of what I call in my book proletarian envy, that they basically could not fathom, d d did not understand why, why the Ukrainians lived better than they did when they'd just been told they were these kind of Nazis. Uh, and that's one of the reasons they looted so frantically, was that, you know, they just... Uh, and I, I talked to... I went, went to a, fa a family house in a village near Chernobyl, which had been occupied, and one woman was showing me around her kitchen, and the three Russian kids who lived there, they were 18, 19-year-olds, year they'd, they'd written Slava Russia, they'd scrawled it on her fridge, they'd scratched it in. They took her frying pans, her spoons, you know, her jewellery, her laptop. I mean, they took very, very, very basic household items because they didn't really have these things. Um, and so, so yeah, and uh, as far as the educated Russians living in Switzerland, I mean, it's really hard. Basically, propaganda works. And it's, this war didn't come from February the 24th. This war came from years of brainwashing and convincing Russians that Ukrainians were subhuman uh, on, on some level, you know, ni ludi, you know. And, and it worked. Unfortunately, it worked. And, and, and also the, some of the other sort of things, you know, from, from you know, Russian friends of mine I don't talk to anymore. Um, you, you, you say, well, look, you know, Ukraine's been invaded, and they just say, what about the Donbass? You know, what about all the victims in the Donbass? Why do you never write about the Donbass? And I go, well, you know, last time I went to Slavyansk, uh, and uh, when the Russians were occupying it, you know, on, on day three, I got stopped at a checkpoint, and the guy put a pistol to my head. It's like, well, why do you never write about Donbass? You know, and it's just this sort of trope of, of victimhood, that Russia is a victim, uh, and also that Russia is reacting. I mean, Putin was doing it yesterday, this whole idea of Tsekalna uh, Afiet, you know, it's a mirror answer to everything. Russia never initiates anything. It's, it's the um, author of nothing. It's the world's eternal victim. History's eternal victim. When this will change, uh, I don't know, but it, the task, I'm afraid, is beyond me. <laughs> possibly, possibly, possibly beyond Ukrainians as well, I suppose, it's for Russians to decolonize their own state. And to follow up on what you were saying, Lesson, and to also um, yeah. echo what you were saying, but is that, you know, so much can be learned from history, and yet, I mean, if we read history and not mythologized version and weaponized version that the Russians have uh, somehow sold to the world about the Second World War, is the arrival of the Soviet army in 1939 in Western Ukraine and Eastern Poland, you know, one of the poorest parts of Europe, uh, to liberate it. Uh, and realizing that actually some of the poorest people in that part of Europe um, are much wealthier than the army that came to liberate them. So, you know, it's a very similar situation. Yeah. And again, the looting from the Second World War too. So, Lotko, I'll come back to you, but I'd like to give Steve an opportunity and then Sophia behind. We have so many questions. Better move to that radiator closer. Yeah, I was going to say. I think you're going to freeze I may have to put my city hat on in a minute. <laughs> right? yeah. okay. So, I see things sometimes like the rationals do. So, this idea of just a big chess game between kind of Russia and America. And sometimes that gets reported in the kind of Western media. So my question is, what could the Western media do better and what have they done wrong in this reporting of Ukraine? What, 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 what have I done wrong or what have we done wrong? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, 
I think I think um, uh, I think what, what one error actually is is the sort of what you could call the, the Stephen you could call, call the Herderian error of uh, conflating language with nationality, and 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 that's something that Putin plays on all the time and instrumentalizes. So, so you, I am rescuing Russian speakers. Go and tell that to the the dead and the ghosts of Mariupol, or or, or the, the the murdered you know sons and daughters of Kharkiv. Um, I am rescuing Russian speakers. I mean, it, it, but but the, the idea that basically there's something to the kind of Putin lie that that Russian you know Rus Russian was repressed as a language, and the people who lived in the Don Donbass area were actually Russians just in Ukraine, and it's quite widespread. Um, it's it, it, you know a lot of people in the U.S. seem to think this is loosely the the case. Elon Musk <laughs> tweeted this map from 2012 saying, look. These people in 2012 voted for Yanukovych's party of the regions, therefore they must be Russians. So that can go to Russia, and the other bit can go to Ukraine. <laughs> hey, I've solved the problem, you know. <laughs> and, and I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, and I mean, he, he's the sort of extreme end of the uh, uh, of that thinking. But um, just to explain, I mean, I actually did this on CNN yesterday. Uh, I just said. You know what you all perfectly understand that Ukraine is bilingual, that you can speak Russian, that that it's not a problem. I mean, I remember talking to uh, a woman called Vika, who I quote in my book, who survived the Mar the bombing of the Mariupol theater. She was with her two kids, and she was in the half that that wasn't hit. I mean, she was concussed, but she got out, and 500 people were killed. And she said, "Look, you know, one, I didn't need saving, and two, I could send my kids to a Russian school, a uh, Russian nursery, or a Ukrainian nursery. I could choose." And, and this is not sort of stressed enough that, that actually now, there is definitely a move towards speaking Ukrainian language, but no one's not going to serve you if you if you ask for something in Russian. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean no, but you you watch. You know, a lot of people seem to think that is the case that Russians are are oppressed and and there's something in that. So. Well, presumably I, you've ordered your coffee in Russian in Ukraine all the time. There you go. Well, actually, you no, got served. No, no? Kiev is so cool. I just do it in English because like yeah. <laughs> If I do in English, but if it's someone over, you know, 50, I'll, I'll do Russian, you know, so. And you get served. <laughs> I always get the coffee, and it's very good coffee, by the way. Indeed, <laughs> indeed it is. Thank you. Sophia, you've been waiting long. Um, if you allow me two questions. The first question is that I remember in 2014 I was trying to explain to myself what is going on, what is happening in Ukraine, and I was reading your book, uh, uh, Mafia State, and in your book, yeah. you say, um, it was clear already in 2008 that the Crimea would be annexed. I'm like, really? <laughs> why? Why didn't anyone try to prevent it? And I assume that it was also clear in 2020, 2021, that there would be an attack, full-scale mm -hmm. inv invasion. Mm -hmm. Why? Why does it seem that the West was so much taken aback? Really, the war has started. Oh no! I mean, so the question: Why? Why, why was it taken aback? Uh, and yeah. the first question and the second question yeah. uh, is: uh, I hear all the time, and I'm Sophia DP. Uh, I hear all the time that how to help Ukraine, what to do uh, in Ukraine. Uh, whether, and I would like, as Ukrainian, I would like to hear in the Western media what to do with Russia. What to do with Russia right now? What to do with Russia if it collapses? What to do with Russia? Because somehow it seems that the West doesn't dare to ask these questions. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Th th yeah. Thanks for reading Mafia State. I mean, to be clear, it, w it wasn't that I, I, I Mafia State came out in 2011. It's just been re-released, and actually, I do think it holds up quite well. I mean, basically, I went to Crimea, from where I'm now banned, together with the rest of the Russian Federation, um, in 2010 after the war in Georgia, because it's you know people were saying you know Crimea next, and uh, I went there, and indeed there was an enormous amount of stuff going on. By Russian special services, they were they were funding, uh, you know, pro-Russian language groups, nurseries. Uh, um, you know, they're very close to kind of you know pro-Russian politicians on the peninsula. And so it wasn't that you know I, I knew 2014 was coming, but it was clear that that, that 
doing it logistically would be quite straightforward. So I, I almost wrote that chapter as a kind of hypothetical. And of course it turned out to be true. I wish it hadn't been true. Um, but also similarly, as we've been discussing, I was convinced that, that something was happening in 2021. What, why did the West not get it? I think because they, uh, as, as one foreign office official put it to me, um, they didn't realize that the Russians don't think the way we think they should think. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 in other words, we think with our you know, Cartesian brains, with our expensive educations, uh, that it's a crazy thing to do to invade a sovereign country in, in 2022 because you're going to be hit by economic sanctions, you're, you're, going, to, uh, uh, you're going to be decoupled from, from, from the Western economy, your people will suffer. Putin doesn't care about that. He, he is in some strange uh, you know, metaphysical realm of his own where, where he's, he's just thinking about history and Peter the Great and, 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 and so on. So, so the, the, the level of Russian irrationality was not properly appreciated. In, in the West. Um, and your, sorry, your second question was? Um, uh, the narrative, what to do with Russia? Yeah, well, so I had a really interesting conversation with uh, Vladimir Karamurza in March. He called me, he was in London, I couldn't see him. Uh, and we were talking about, he was talking about what a disaster this was, how he thought the war would lead to change inside Russia as inevitably did. Uh, talking about previous Russian defeats, including in, in, in the war against Japan, and saying that, that, that it was time to think about uh, a Marshall Plan for Russia, about deputinization, about lustration, uh, about a kind of new opposition, etc. And of course, you know, all of this is true, and despite everyone urging him not to go back to Moscow, he went back to Moscow, he was arrested, and now he's looking at 20 years in jail. So he's, he's not in any position to do any of this. But I think it's right that we, we, we start thinking about Russian collapse and about how Russia might be reconstructed. But the, the problem is, for now, Ukraine has to win. Mm -hmm. Ukraine has to win. And, and the priority of the West is not really thinking about you know, rebuilding a post-Putin Russia. The priority has to be to, to give Ukraine the weapons so it can win this war. That, that, is, that is the priority. It's not just reconstructing Russia after the war. Yeah. It's rather how to stop Russia now? And how well, so, 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 so where, where we are, to my mind, you, you know, how to stop Russia now, we're back to containment. We're in a state of near containment. I mean, the, 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 the Cold War, the long telegram, the, the, the idea that, that, that actually there's no point in trying to have dialogue, as Emmanuel Macron endlessly wants to do with Putin, for, you know, fuck dialogue. I mean, uh, it's not the moment for dialogue. It's, it, unfortunately, it's just the moment for, to, to con contain Russia. And, yeah, we, we hope that Russia changes, but if it doesn't, we, we have to prepare for the worst. Just on the point of irrationality, you know, let's not forget that there were years and years of impunity um, after the occupation of Crimea and aggression in Donbass, so maybe it wasn't that irrational to keep testing how far it can go. No, no, sure. Well, but that's what I'm saying, the point yeah. about, you know, you push, you yeah. wait for the response, but yeah. there's no response, so you, yeah, yeah. you push yeah. further. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Lodka, please. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening, ladies. Hi. <laughs> Um, before I came here, I had a look through my father's uh, book collection, yeah, and I found this book, How to Defeat Russia. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> where, where, where was it published? I it was <laughs> and it's interesting that everything you've talked about this evening, yeah, is in this book. <laughs> <laughs> another, I haven't read it, okay. This book was published in 1968. Okay. <laughs> so, and it, you know, by Cliff Cambridge, came right to the war. Okay. So it's just, and for me, it's a collective failure, not from 2004. This is a collective failure and part of the West over the last 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that needs to be taken into account. Sure. And the one question for me is the fact that if you look at UN voting patterns over the last few months, it's been very disappointing, yeah? especially when it comes to African countries, Asian subcontinent, and South America. What can Ukraine and maybe even the Western partners do to change the voting patterns of the countries in the UN to make them more? Supportive of Ukraine, or is that yeah. a long drawn out? Process? Yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting question. I, I mean, uh, and again, it's one I explore in in, in the book uh, to some extent. Was because we, we sort of think you know everyone is with Ukraine, but it's true the global South, if you if you can call it that, is not or not so much, especially India, South Africa. I mean, I, I, I do know because I, you know I've, I've t talked to the Zelensky team a lot that they're very concerned about this, and they've been doing as much outreach as they can. So you know with, with 
uh, journalists with, with uh, d uh, diplomatic missions. I mean, the whole grain initiative as well has been quite, that's been, you know, quite, quite successful, I think. And, and you know, what one um, minor and, and trivial, you know, really trivial kind of the thing is that I haven't yet been able to interview Zelensky. You know, I, if anyone here can arrange that for me, <laughs> if you can make a call, uh, I'd be really happy to do that. Uh, well, and yet Zelensky will, will sit down and he will spend two hours with African journalists. And basically it's because they're quite ruthlessly strategic. They, they, they don't need the Guardian, right? They, they kind of know <laughs> probably that what I write is going to be okay. Uh, whereas they do need better media, you know, a higher profile in, in much of Latin America and, and India and so on. And so they really are trying to kind of reach out to those constituencies. So there is a problem and there's a view that actually this is a European war and it's nothing to do with us. And actually it, 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 it is it's to do with everybody because it's a war for, it's everyone's war for, for democracy and for decency and for, for, for truth. But getting that message out has, has been hard. And also misunderstanding Russia as a, or not understanding Russia as a new imperialist or imperialist state. I mean, yeah, it's really hard to communicate sure, that message, sure. and we need to do better to do that. There's so many questions here, but I propose we collect three um, at the same time. See if you freeze after that, it's and then maybe we move on to, to the library yeah, to continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, so um, Ursula and then Michael and then this. Maybe we can collect them in the cluster. Yeah, okay, Ursula. Really sure. Uh, thank you so much. For no, I'm sure. Um, and really wonderful what you've done for the coverage in the Gulf. Thank Amazing. you. Um, one of the really interesting things about the last 10 years has been everybody's eyes opening at different rates in different ways to how Russian propaganda has influenced their thinking. In the last 10 years, in the last 15 years. Yeah. Uh, tell us about a couple of your light uh, uh, Did all your light bulb moments happen in 2007? And when's your book light bulb? Moment? <laughs> I think I can tell. I, 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 I think that. that, that <laughs> okay, let's keep going. Shall, shall we take the other two questions? Yes, uh, then this, please, and then Mike. That is somewhat related. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so I spent a bit of time in, uh, in, in the top of us, in 2014 and 15, talking yeah. to people. And it would be fair to say that in general, I think Russians behave relatively well towards the civilians. Now in 2022, their behavior is radically, radically different mm -hmm. against civilians. Now, what has changed? Is it all propaganda or is it something else? Yeah. Uh, and Michael. Uh, well, thanks, Celestia. Um, firstly, thank you for your courageous reporting. I said, second, what first thing you were about. My question, I've lost count of the number of times I've heard military experts and foreign policy talk about, uh, experts talk about this will end like all of, end like all of the wars with negotiations. But if you run a filter through all of the wars since the Second World War, um, this is the first one that I could maybe some of the room smarter than me can remember. Another one where the aggressor started out in, in its, obviously, the invasion. It was existential for the invaded country, but it now becomes existential for the invader. And I can't think of another war in the last 70 years where that's been true. And therefore, it's very hard to see how this does end in negotiations with any other outcome than the defeat of Russia. So I don't know what you, what, what you, how you react when you hear people talk about negotiations. Uh, yeah, doesn't seem to make any sense. Yeah, I, I might do the questions in reverse order. Uh, I mean, I, I think that's right. I think it is existential for Russia. Uh, and it seems pretty clear to me that, that, that I, had a, I was having an interesting chat with uh, Andrei Zagorodnyuk, the former defence minister. I saw him in London uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And he, he was saying, I mean, this is slightly hypothetical, but, but Severyevkin, the, the Russian general who's come in and is now in overall charge of the war, seems to have said to Putin, look, forget about Kherson. Well, you know, Kherson, we will retreat from the right bank. I will give you Donbass. And I think the reason they're pushing so... so uh, crazily, so robotically, so with such huge casualty numbers around Bakhmut, is because Putin basically wants the Donbass. If he can take the Donbass, he can sell that as victory to his domestic population, and then he can say to the West, "Okay, we will stop. We'll, we'll declare a ceasefire." Uh, yeah, and, but of course, he'll hang on to all the charity that he's he, he's got, and just say, "Well, it's the Ukrainians; they don't want peace. You know, we're ready to negotiate, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. I think that's the play. It's not going to work because I, I think they will struggle to take the rest of the Donbass. Firstly, secondly, I can see Ukrainian counterfensives, possibly in winter, possibly in the spring, certainly taking back more of the south, um, and it is a problem for Putin because. 
Uh, partly because his, his, his aims keep on morphing from taking all of Ukraine to de desatanizing it to de Ukrainizing it. I don't know what Russian victory looks like, really. Um, but the problem is that Putin will keep going, keep going, keep going. If he loses 20,000 guys, he doesn't think we need to change our tactics. He thinks, let's get another 20,000 guys <laughs> and, and throw them into the mincer. That, that's, that's how he thinks. You know? So difficult to, to deal with an opponent like that. Uh, on Donetsk, I, mean, I wasn't Donetsk in 2014 when it all started. And actually, there was an awful lot of kind of intimidation and nastiness mm -hmm. going on. I mean, I met Gherkin's people. Uh, they were terrifying, and they were, they were, and I wrote about this for the Guardian. They were kidnapping pro-Ukrainian deputies. They were torturing them. They were murdering them. They were dumping their bodies in rivers. There were pro-Ukrainian demonstrations in Donetsk, which were violently beaten up by guys with iron bars. And after that, there were fewer demonstrations, uh, and a lot of people were handed out and, and, and made to leave. So, so. Oh, you said that, yeah, the concentration camp was established. Yeah, I mean the concentration camps, and also, you know, the bottom line is that without Russian intervention, you know, that would never have happened. There, there was, the, we have to acknowledge there were disagreements. There were people who had different positions. There were certainly people who were pro-Russian in Donetsk. Whether they were a majority is another question. I don't think they were. But, but there were political mechanisms for solving those problems. But the whole thing was militarized uh, you know, by, um, by Putin. And as I said to my Russian friends, you know, where did the DNR get their tanks from? You know, I mean, you can't go buy them from the supermarket, right? I mean, so you, you, the, the level of sadism now is a different planet from what it was, I think. Uh, uh, why? No, why? Why is that? I'm not sure what. It's just called better hidden. Mm. I, I think. It, it's literally the same. Mm. Well, yes, it's just, exactly. Mm -hmm. I'm from the Niets. I know what was going on right at the beginning. I mean, I think, I think it, I, yeah, I mean, I would broadly agree with that. And I think it's just on a bigger scale now. And it, it's because it's now thousands of soldiers and it's just the front line is 1,300 kilometers. And also the other thing is that these areas have been deoccupied. I mean, you know, we, we can go and, you know, I can go and I can go and spend a day in a Zoom. I'll never forget my day in a Zoom. I mean, I went to a mass grave and then I was shown around the city by a local journalist who survived um, because the city was liberated. He'd been in Russian custody and, the, and the, he took me around the police station and showed me the room where they had tortured him with electric shocks. And it took him a long time to find out where the room was because the bag was over his head. And in the end, he recognized it because it was a step. And they'd done it using a field telephone. Um, and it was a wind-up field telephone, and they put electrodes on the uh, uh, clip on his finger with, with wires, and they wound this up, and then they shocked him. And, and this was happening everywhere. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, w w w w we have to see what happens in Donetsk and Luhansk and how many people are receptive should Ukraine win it back. I don't know. Uh, uh, sorry, on the propaganda. Uh, What's happened to all of that that, you know, riddled the entire... Oh, oh, two, two great questions. So uh, let me just tell you briefly the story of uh, Artem Majulin. Um, and uh, so basically I was um, in Lviv just after the invasion. I was having breakfast and I, I basically I talked to everybody. That's my method. I was talk talking to the waiter. Uh, and I said, yeah, I don't suppose you'd be anyone in Kharkiv, do you? Because at that point the Russians had tried to seek it. And he said, yeah, I've got, I've got a friend of mine. He's called Artem. And he's an English teacher. So I, I called Artem, I said, what's going on? He said, there's gunfire in the streets. I can hear machine gun. I'm in a, in a basement with a whole bunch of people. And one of them's an electrician. And he's just done it so we can charge our phones and <laughs> etc. And, and then I called Artem again. And he said, yeah, I'm going to uh, uh, go to the train station. And I'm walking out with my brother. Uh, and then he turned up in Lviv about five days later. He managed to escape. Very clever guy. He lived in China. He spoke impeccable English. He ran a kind of online English uh, tuition business from Kharkiv. And um, I just had a, I had a light bulb moment. And I said, I said, what, what, what are you going to do now? And he said, oh, I don't know. And I said, well, why don't you become a fixer? And he said, what's a fixer? <laughs> and I said, well, you work with basically clueless Western journalists who, who, who come in and you explain to them about Ukraine because he understood the, the politics, he understood everything perfectly. And um, then uh, a week later, I had an Italian colleague who came in from Palermo, a nice guy called Lorenzo. And he and Artem, they just bonded like brothers. And Artem has been with us, you know, interpreting Ukraine, I, I mean, basically for my, for my colleagues who don't speak Russian, don't speak Ukrainian, don't know the region, ever since. And he was just outside Bakhmut two days ago with my colleague Peter Beaumont. He's brave, 
he is versatile, uh, he is fun, he is multilingual, he speaks Chinese, uh, and I've met so many clever, interesting, uh, educated uh, people in Ukraine, and, and uh, we, we just need to pay tribute to them. I mean, they, 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 there's, there's amazing kind of journalists as well, and I've tried to get um, people um, to, people like Natalia Gomenyuk, not, not, the, not the press spokesman, but the journalist, to, to write for The Guardian. So I've, I've tried to get as many Ukrainian voices in The Guardian as I can. Andrei Kirkov sends me his pieces, and then I forward them to The Guardian and say, you know, print this. And, and, and mostly, you know, I succeed, not always. But, but I've been trying to kind of Ukrainize our coverage, so it's not just foreigners writing about it, it's actually Ukrainians as well. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I'm on, on Russia's Russian spies being rubbish, who'd have known? <laughs> I, I, I mean, you know, I, 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 I don't know if anyone, did anyone see a very expensive poison at the old Vic, the play yes. based on my book? Yeah, I mean, well, where, so Lucy, Lucy Preble absolutely captured the cluelessness of these Russian assassins who took three attempts to kill a guy and were trying to pick up women unsuccessfully, you know, pouring polonium down the, the hotel plug hole. I mean, um, you know, and I've had lots of conversations with uh, people like Viktor Savorov, uh, who say that the quality of Ukrainian, of, of Russian spies has just gone right down since the Cold War, when actually the ones in foreign intelligence were quite bright. Now they're all dumb. And I think what happened was that, briefly, uh, that there was a huge amount of money allocated to, to the FSB and, and you know, to other agencies to prepare a network of agents and informants, and I suspect 90% of it was stolen. Uh, and all they did was call up people from the opposition bloc who, who said, yeah, you know, Zelensky is corrupt, he's a narcomaniac, you know, they're all, you know, everyone hates him, you know, none of which is true. Um, and, you know, it'll be, it'll, be a, it'll be a breeze. And so they, 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 they file, file their kind of declared, they file their report saying, you know, yeah, Zelensky's got no support, everyone's waiting for Russia, and the FSB then you know, relay this to Putin, and, and that's it. So, so the whole thing was shambolic and incompetent. Well, on that note, I am prepared to end, I have to say. And if you didn't manage to ask your question and didn't get it answered yet, I recommend that you purchase the book tonight, next door in the library, and you'll get a lot of answers. And Luke will be there very kindly to sign it for you. Luke, what can I say? Thank you so much for this discussion and for the book. Thank you. I, I just have two words to say to everybody. Slava Ukraini. Heroim Slava.